confused by the name. In the dark, Kabul reminded Frank of Los Angeles. A picnic blanket of lights shone on the dark horizon in all directions. The valley Kabul filled was smaller than the Los Angeles basin, giving the city a crowded, claustrophobic feel. The hills were higher, tortured purple shapes against the dark velvet sky. The lights of the densely packed ancient city were as thick and sparkling as the lights of LA. The pearly light of dawn revealed a city that sprawled like LA but was immeasurably older. The dusty streets passed new glass-sided buildings that could have been transplants from the San Fernando Valley and sprawling mud-colored tenements that clung to the hillsides like Hopi Pueblos. For a young woman who had barely left the West Coast before joining the army, it was all pretty exotic. On three sides, the city was overtopped by jagged, snow-covered peaks. The height of the surrounding mountains was staggering, but only hinted at the immensity of the, of the mountains beyond. Frank had to keep reminding herself that no matter how gigantic they seemed, they were only the foothills of the Himalayas. It took a few days for her eyes to get used to the colors and shapes of the Central Asian city. Even the metallic sunlight that tore long shadows from everything it touched seemed strange to her eyes, long accustomed to the softer silver sunlight peeking through the clouds of the Pacific Northwest. Even on days when the sky curdled in a home-like way, she could always tell that coppery sun was toasting the clouds on one side. No matter how foreign and jarring the scenery, the United States Army provided restful uniformity. Nothing unusual or out of place was allowed anywhere on base. Well-paved roads lined with neatly painted white stones past wooden buildings exactly like those found in California and Georgia and everywhere else the U.S. Army had put down roots. As a newly promoted sergeant, Frank no longer did the menial busy work that maintained the environment of the military post. Instead, she supervised a small crew as they polished floors, pulled weeds, painted rocks, repaired potholes, and policed cigarette butts. But that wouldn't start for a few days. In the meantime, it would be nice to get to know this foreign country that would be her home for the next two years. Some of the soldiers went out in civilian clothes when they were off duty, but Frank stayed in uniform, which meant she had to be armed. It gave her an odd feeling of vulnerability to carry an assault weapon and sidearm in the streets, as if she was the town gunfighter, overly visible, calling out anyone who wanted to challenge her. Frank stopped on the corner in front of a doorway decorated with blue glazed tile. She lit a cigarette as she examined the intricate, almost psychedelic pattern of the glazing. Walking with a lit cigarette for self-defense had been a habit since her teens, and it always helped her stay calm. A trail of small boys began to gather behind her. She was told there was a brisk market for hand-rolled cigarettes and flung longer and longer butts to her favorites. She followed the line of pale blue and green tiles around the corner and seemed to step back in time about a thousand years. Two well-armed MPs on duty at the entrance let her know that she was not dreaming. Behind them was a market that could easily have been meeting on the same spot for 3,000 years. Tables, blankets, and rude stalls offered everything and anything that could be found or scrounged up in the city. There were tools and weapons, articles of clothing, trinkets, gifts, and various things to eat and drink. The MPs eyed her uniform and weapon and nodded Frank through, tight-lipped and solemn. There were only a few men visible in the market and they were old and feeble. Everyone else was dressed in full burqa garb. Yards of black fabric concealed every feature. Frank felt like a cat in a flock of crows. When Frank's grandfather had been a young man in the 1970s, Kabul had been one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, with the best educated generation of any city in Asia. Then came the Soviets, the Mujahideen, the Taliban, and the Americans. After generations of war, Afghanis had learned to hide. Fundamentalist strictures made it easy to hide, and as long as you provided a veil of respectability, you might be able to maintain a human spirit. The fabled woman's market, full of shadowy, veiled people, going about shadowy veiled errands provided a clear illustration of the point. The marketers were friendly and many of them offered Frank samples. Most of them knew at least, at least a few English words and they liked to tell her the names of things 
and laugh at her attempts to repeat the foreign words. She was having fun and getting hoarse when yelling broke out behind her. She turned toward the sound and automatically checked the two MPs at the gate. They were both looking in her direction alert. There was a knot of people between Frank and the MPs arguing and struggling over something. Suddenly a bang tore at Frank's eardrums and five or six of the women were flung to the ground. A severed hand with most of the forearm attached flew across Frank's field of vision. For a moment, her brain told her it couldn't be real, and then she realized the bloody appendage would have hit her in the chest if she didn't move. Frank stepped to the side as the hand flopped to the curb with a wet plunk. Frank nearly threw up as she realized the fingers were clutched around the handle of a suitcase that had been torn loose in the blast. She lowered her head and took deep breaths. Her ears, stunned by the sudden sound, took some time to tell her there was screaming. Frank opened her eyes. The market had been turned into a disaster site. Market sellers, their mouths open in distress, scrambled to salvage their wares and get them undercover. Bodies, strewn around, limp or moving in pain, were accented by bright splashes of blood. The screaming came from a woman whose bleeding stump of an arm was being wrapped in a tourniquet. Ears ringing, Frank looked around for some way to help. A woman sprawled on her back, the black shroud of her burqa twisted to show a splash of green fabric underneath. Frank walked closer, thinking she must be dead in that position. The woman's veil was blown off in the explosion, and her face, visible, turned up toward the sky. Frank was surprised that under the veil, the woman wore makeup on her eyes. The heavy black lines gave her face an, a gothic appearance. Frank almost jumped out of her skin when she realized the woman's eyes were open. She was still alive. Frank dropped to her knees. The woman was trying to say something. Frank leaned closer, but the language was meaningless. English, Frank asked hopefully, leaning closer to hear the ragged voice. Hurt, head, me, the woman groaned, closing her eyes painfully as a tear left a dark line down her cheek. Frank lifted the woman's head slightly from the gravel walkway. The long, glossy back, black hair was clumped with clots of blood. A patch of scalp was gone, and with it, the bone of the woman's skull. Frank could see pink, a pinkish-gray mass of exposed brain, bits of gravel embedded in the moist tissue. Frank felt her stomach rise, and saliva filled her mouth. She gulped it down. She couldn't lay the exposed brain back on the dirt. She pulled her barracks cap from the loop on her trousers and placed it under the woman's head, gently lowering her. It's going to be OK, Frank said. An ambulance pulled into the market and stopped not far away. The driver jumped out and began shouting at authority at the two MPs. Frank turned back to the injured woman. Her eyes open again, looked far away and dreamy. Her lips weren't moving, but she was whispering words in her own language. Frank hoped they were a prayer. You just stay right here, Frank said gently. Don't move. I'm going to get you on that ambulance and they'll get you fixed up in no time. The woman didn't seem to notice Frank's words. Frank stood up and approached the ambulance where the three men were arguing. Well, then there's no hassle, the ambulance driver said. If there's no American nationals to transport, we can haul any locals that are worth hauling. What do you got? Over here, Frank said, woman with a head wound. We've got to get her to a hospital now. Let me see, the medic said. Frank pointed and walked with the tall, lanky man back to the fallen woman. He knelt beside her, lifted her head, and whistled before lowering her gently onto Frank's bloody cap. He flashed a small flashlight into her eyes and then stood up. No transport, he said. She's expectant. <coughs> what do you mean, Frank demanded. If we don't get her to a hospital now, she's going to die. The medic looked at her with a twisted smile. He shook his head. She's going to die anyway, he said. Don't you know what expectant means? Frank looked at the injured woman. It didn't seem right to leave her to die sprawled on the gravel like that. The woman's eyes stared blankly at the sky. Her lips moved now, but her words made no sound. The medic noticed the woman receiving first aid, who had finally stopped screaming. You at the tourniquet, he called. Get in the ambulance. He looked around. Anybody else? There were no more takers. He took one last look around and called out in surprise. He strode across the walkway to where Frank had been standing when the bomb exploded. I think we're in luck, he exclaimed. He bent down and picked something up. Is this your hand, he called, holding the dismembered hand up in the bright light. With a smile on his face, he marched back to the ambulance with the severed hand, 
and placed it in the back with the wounded woman. He turned to the two MPs who still stood on alert nearby with grim expressions. Would you please inform Sergeant Darling that this is war, he announced in a loud voice. People die in war. Thanks.